Well, welcome church. It is good to be together here in person at the church or online, separated in space, but gathered in the name of Jesus to praise him for he is worthy. Uh, a special welcome to those who are new to Emmanuel services. We'd love to hear from you. There are some different ways of doing that. Uh, online especially. Drop us a line. There's some different links provided for you. And, and yeah, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to connect and, and be on a journey together, the church together, to grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, this past Thursday, it was Canada Day. And Canada Day this year was different, wasn't it? Yes, it's still a pandemic kind of celebration, so there's more distance and there's fewer large crowds and all of that. But in addition to all of that, of course, was all that news of the residential schools, those dark chapters of our nation's history. And it's really changed the way we celebrate and it probably at least should change the way we celebrate and think about this great nation. Now, personally, uh, I immigrated to this country. I'm very much aware of how blessed I am to live here. On the other hand, yeah, those dark chapters, they are real as well. And, and somehow we have to find a way forward. And so my hope is that during this service, today, we'll be able to keep some of that in balance and tension, if you will, uh, not neglecting it, not ignoring these, these different issues, but to, in some way, together, find a way forward in being a nation, being a group of people, uh, living with so much of God's many blessings. Let's begin then with the singing of O Canada, and then I'll bring some other dynamics into that that will keep all of this in tension. But let's sing together our national anthem and the next two verses. Pray. 
sing these verses. We sing it as a prayer for your mercy on this land. Lord, there is so much so good, but there is almost also, also so much broken. There is so much pain and baggage and so many dark chapters in our history that have led to so much pain and suffering. Yet somehow, Lord, you want us to be a people of reconciliation. And for us to be that, Lord, first and foremost, we, we look to you and we ask you for your help now to see um, well, what, that which is not right. Lord, we need your help. And with Nehemiah, we pray and we confess not only our own sins and the sins of our fathers, but the sins of our nation. We ask you, Lord, for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, indeed, I want to give you now an opportunity to spend a few moments to reflect on that brokenness of our nation. Bring that before God in your own words and prayer. Let's in song now turn to our Father and ask Him to change our hearts. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grave. Close. 
seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty that he's left his spirit in us and with us to lead us and guide us of course we do look to that look forward to that time where Jesus will return and I don't know about you but there's days when everything just seems so dark and so problematic that we cry out how long O oh Lord before you return of course, it's two-sided because so many people continue to be lost and need that life-giving relationship with Jesus. And yet the suffering is great too when we look forward to the time when Jesus will return to renew all things. And so let's sing about that song. I believe we learned it during the Advent season. How long, O Lord? Every valley will be lifted high, and 
when the weak will be the strong. When you come like lightning in the sky, how long, oh Lord, how long? Kings on the earth will scatter when they hear thundering sounds of angel songs. Hearts will tremble, filled with holy fear. How long? on you, that your promises are true, and one day you will return. All our treasures here will fade, so we long to see your face, until then our hearts will burn. How long Continue our time of worship. Um, yeah, we want to draw your attention to worship and generosity. Uh, yeah, you don't know how to give during this time of not being at the church. All that information is available on our website. If you go to our homepage, top left hand corner is a button that says give now. Just click on that and it will show you a whole variety of different ways of doing that. And otherwise, just give us a call here at the church during the week. We'll gladly help you figure that out. But of course, it's all about worship. Giving to God is an act of worship. He is worthy of our everything, including that part. Now, myself, as you know, this coming month I will be away. There will be some vacation, some sabbatical, reflecting on this past year, and trying to discern the way forward as we plan to gather again on August the 8th in person live worship services. So yeah, be planning for that. Until then, everything will be pre-recorded, and it's pre-recorded this month by four different groups of people from Emmanuel Church. They've been busy planning these services, uh, recording the different components. Very, very much looking forward to seeing what's going to come from all of that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that during the message as well today. Now, some real sad news through this past week. Uh, 
shocking news and we just didn't see this coming. Uh, but the passing of Gary Wagner, he of course struggled with cancer for quite some time. He, uh, earlier on in that battle with cancer, he made some great strides, wrote a, a little booklet about it. That booklet is still available in our uh, foyer here in the church. There's quite a few uh, still there for you to have a look at. If you haven't read that before, it's quite encouraging to see God's role in that whole journey with cancer. But yeah, he somewhat unexpectedly passed away this past week. And uh, so let's continue to pray uh, for Jane, his wife, and the extended family there as well. That brings us to a testimony. Um, last week, I talked about God changing our plans, our willingness to allow God to change our plans, right? to transform our plans. And this week, Linda Thorson wrote me a message said, oh, that has been so real in my life. And so she has an example of this. And we thought, you know, we're just going to include that in this service as well to kind of connect this service to what we talked about last week. So enjoy that message. And then after that, we'll get into a children's story. In 1983, my husband and I had just finished gutting and ran about dating home in the home bay. It would be paid for in nine years, which was really exciting. He was approached by a grocery store in Liverpool, which would mean selling our house and using the equity for this store and another house. I prayed long and hard that God wouldn't allow this to happen if it was a bad decision. But I pleaded with him to answer the prayer my way. But it went on the market, sold, and we moved. I knew there had to be a purpose. But was I going to fight God or see what he was up to? To backtrack, my dad had left my mom when I had just finished college, and this was many years later. I hadn't seen or spoken to him from that day. I had re He had remarried and moved to New Brunswick. I had a Christian couple I'd known for years in this new community, so I began taking my son to their church. I met one of her friends, Bonnie, who had two girls Jeff's age there as well, so that was really nice. Within nine months, though, our store was losing money, and things were bad. I was wondering where God was in this whole mess. One day, Bonnie was at my house, and I realized for the first time she was the daughter of the woman for whom my dad had left my mother and had married. As she was leaving that day, she said very gently, Linda, your dad would love to hear from you. For about three days, those words would not leave me alone. I realized I had forgiven my dad, but he didn't know that. I suddenly realized that God had brought us to that place to begin a restoration. I called my dad a few evenings later and we both cried. It was amazing. God had transformed my desire to become his desire. Well, kids, uh, have you ever played that game called Telephone Tag? I think we talked about it in family worship a few weeks ago. But Telephone Tag, of course, is where you sit down as a group, say, around a campfire, and one person starts the game by whispering a sentence into someone's ear, right? To the person right beside them and just whispers it in their ear. And then they do the same thing. They pass on what they heard to the next person and they pass on to the next person what they heard, and it goes all the way around the circle till it gets back to the first person. And that's where it really gets fun. Because then all of a sudden you hear that what it started with got totally changed as it got passed on from one person to the other. And it's funny, sometimes it's just hilarious. Maybe we'll play the game around the campfire at our summer family camp at Johnson Christian Park later next month. Anyway, um, it's gonna be really exciting. Yeah, that, and that, it's a fun game to play. Now, it is fun if it doesn't really matter. 
But what if you have to pass on information that really does matter? Say you call 911 because the house is on fire and the person who picks up the phone on the other end writes the address down wrong or writes it down right but then passes it on wrong to the next person, to the fire chief kind of thing. And then the fire truck goes to the wrong place. And now you got a big problem, right? Well, the same is kind of true in the church. Sometimes, well, I don't think things get passed on right from one generation to the next generation. I mean, you know that Jesus lived 2,000 years ago, right? He, he walked the earth and the church was started eventually. And, and now we've had church for 2,000 years. And some, some of the things we do, well, they're nothing like, well, the way the church used to do it. Now, change is all good, but in the end, we got to make sure that we do it right. That we keep doing it the way God wants us to do this, right? And thankfully, we have a lot of help because we don't just depend on people passing things on by whispering it in someone's ear. We, we have the Bible. I mean, God's friends, right? The apostles, they wrote letters and we have those in the New Testament. We know exactly what that was all about. But anyway, we're going to give you a chance for a little break, about a minute or so. And during that break, I want you to think about this. What about church today has changed so much from what the Bible says that you hardly recognize it? Go Think about that for a moment, chat about it if you're by, with some other folks, and then uh, come right back. Did you come up with something? Did you come up with an issue where you're, where you're kind of wondering, like, how on earth did we get here? I mean, this was so important, and yet we seem to have totally messed it up. I mean, we've been talking a little bit about the problems of the residential schools that are coming out in the news, the horrors, right? I mean, how did the church get involved in that? I know there's all kinds of reasons for that, but how did the church get involved in that? I know it was a different time and he had different values, but it shouldn't matter because the church is not supposed to be like everyone else. We, and we've got the word of God and the word of God is abundantly clear that we are to love and that God's heart is for all tribes and languages and people from all nations, right? So how did we get there? I wonder about that. How did we get involved in these horrors? Now, instead of answering that, I want to instead today look at similar tendencies we even have today. I know it's kind of a humbling thing, but it's true. Specifically the tendency to not let the Bible be the final authority in all matters of faith and practice as our statement of faith says. I mean, we do this all the time. We say we believe that, but then we don't put it into practice. And I hope that as we talk about this, that we will become more vigilant about it and more committed to letting the scriptures, the word of God, be the word of God and be our authority. So to go back to our break then, what has changed so much in church that you hardly recognize it. Well, here's one for us that I want to talk about. 
And that is that our worship services are nothing like what we find described in the New Testament. Marion Dix is going to be reading to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 to 33. And I want you to pay especially attention to that first verse you will be reading. And, and, and begin to think right away, is that how we gather as a Christian community? Here you go, Marion Dix. Good order of, in worship. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation? Everything must be done so that church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. There is no interpreter. The speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what he said. And if a rev revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speak speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of Lord's people. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you is a hymn, or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation? <laughs> is that how we gather today? I mean, do we gather with the idea that everyone who gathers on a Sunday morning has at least potentially active involvement in the church service? I mean, other than singing along, right? But actually potentially be called on to say a word, to speak a word? No, that's not how church is done today. I mean, there's a few groups who do it this way, but by far the majority of Christians never experience this. Instead, we have carefully planned services where a professional gets up and teaches for 30 to 40 minutes, where a band who is well rehearsed leads the singing. Few people are then involved in actually delivering the content of the service. Now, the good part of it all is that it leads to a smooth service often, high quality, or at least higher quality. Uh, it's comfortable to watch, pleasing to the eyes and to the ears, right? So that's the good part. But some days I look at that whole scene and I go, how did we get here? How did we get here? When 1 Corinthians 14 lays it out clearly that when the early church came together as a Christian community, each of them could have a hymn or a tongue or an interpretation. Revelation. They all potentially had something to add to that service. They were all expected to be tuned into God so intimately that God might just speak through them to the entire group. How did we get here? There are many reasons for it. Is it possible that just one generation failed to pass it on to the next? Well, no, not really, because we've got 1 Corinthians 14. Every generation could have read that and applied that. There's some other reasons as well. I mean, I think you can look back to Emperor Constantine, who legalized Christianity, and then after that, it wasn't just legal to be a Christian. Christianity became the state religion. And when it became the state religion, well, that came with a massive change in structures. It came with buildings. It came with professional uh, clergy who were able to devote time to be well prepared. And at the same time, of course, because the state and the church were now kind of in cahoots, if you will, well, it was used to keep some control, right? They, they would not necessarily want to open it up to the rest of the body of believers because who knows what they were going to say. So there was that sense of trying to keep control. Let's just keep it neat and tidy. And oh, I, I, I sense that. 
in our churches today. And of course, with Christianity being the state religion, more and more people joining the church, but not necessarily because they were sold out to Jesus Christ, because, not necessarily because they had surrendered their lives to Jesus. There were a lot of benefits to be had now, worldly benefits to be coming to church, right? I mean, if you wanted to be anyone in society, you had to be a Christian. And so they just joined the church for earthly benefits. And those more nominal Christians, of course, well, they wouldn't really be interested in listening to God and speaking those words and all that came along with that. They, they, they're more than happy to just let the, the clergy, the professional clergy, do their work, and then uh, they would just show up and watch and do the things they were told to do, and then they carry on and do their own thing again. Now, this whole development has kept the nominal Christian, or really the majority of Christians, from not being engaged in church, in listening to God, in perceiving what God has for us. They just show up for a service. Now, it's not an excuse because all the while we had the scriptures, right? So if you could read the scriptures, if you were aware of these scriptures, I mean, the truth was right there. God's will for the early church, for the church, was right there. Anyway. And what was that will? 1 Corinthians 14, 26, once more. When you come together, each of you is a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. So everyone could be involved, and the whole goal was what? The building up of the church. Now, that's very similar language to what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Listen to this. You know this passage as well. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So what we see there is that God gifted certain people with what were referred to as the speaking gifts, but he gifted those people not so that they could just be the ones doing the speaking, but so that they could equip everyone else to get involved with the speaking. You say, whoa, 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 I, I, I don't have a gift of evangelism. I mean, I don't really sense I have a great gift in that area either. I had a friend, Greg, who had that gift. I mean, he came to faith later on in life, but I'm telling you, once he came to faith in Jesus, once he had been set free, had been forgiven, he became a follower of Jesus, I mean, that gift became active, and he couldn't stop talking about his Savior. It was amazing. At one point, he moves to a new community. He was a mechanic, starts working in this mechanic shop. And within three days of starting, he had all these mechanics coming to church early. Uh, sorry, he, he had all these mechanics coming to work early, before 8 o'clock in the morning, to have a Bible study with them. I mean, who can pull that off? Great good. Telling you, the, the guy was gifted in that area. Now, in today's world, the church might have this tendency to just hire Greg or the Greeks of the church to do the evangelism for the church. But is that what the Bible teaches? No, it's not. The Bible teaches that the Greeks of the church are to equip everyone else to evangelize. And now we all get really nervous, right? It's like, well, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to be going door to door, and I don't want to stand on a soapbox in the street corner. I, I don't sense I have that call. Well, you may not have a call to do all that, but you most certainly have a call to share your faith with your own children. Right? I mean, we do all have a responsibility in passing on this faith to the next generation. And so we better be equipped, and God has graciously gifted some people to equip us. Now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This passage where everyone, at least potentially, could be actively involved in speaking during this worship service. 
One of the reasons for not embracing that today, I'm sure, is the risk of messiness, of more chaotic scenes, of problems arising, of just not having it organized, not having that kind of control. And it's a fair concern. It was a fair concern in the first century too, and so Paul lays out some guidelines. And he applies the two of these gifts, the gifts of tongues and the gift of prophecy. We're just going to briefly look at that second one, the one of prophecy. Here, prophecy refers to uh, reporting to others a message that was received from God, either before the church service or even during the church service. So the idea here is that, that someone is so intimate with God that they perceive a message from God, a word, a revelation of some type, and then has the opportunity to pass that on to the rest of the church. By the way, that ability to perceive God's word, to hear from God, is a big part of the abide lessons that I've been leading different groups through. And again, I mentioned this last week, but I just highly recommend that if you haven't taken that course, to take that course this fall. So that's the abide lessons, learning to perceive God's voice. But anyway, here, this is the, the guideline that Paul lays out. Verse 29, two or three prophets should speak. And the other should weigh carefully what is said. So not everyone gets to speak. Not everyone who believes they have a word from God necessarily gets to speak. It wouldn't end, right? Two or three. And everyone else is supposed to carefully listen and kind of weigh is what is being said true. So there is some checks and balances here, right? And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. You can see how this lays out, how this comes together. There's order to all this. Paul writes, the spirit of prophets are subject to the control of prophets, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregation of the Lord's people. Now is this process, this model of a church service always predictable? No, not at all. Is it always perfectly safe? Nope. But are there checks and balances? Absolutely there are. And this then is clearly what the New Testament pictures a Christian gathering to look like. But is that what we have today? Well, no. So how did we get here? How did we get away from what Scripture lays out to what we've got going today and all the while say that the Scripture is the final authority of all matters of faith and practice? Right? And what if we had kept going with this? This is just a hypothetical question. And I'm not even sure that it would have fixed the issue, okay? But just as a thought-provoking thought, what if we had kept going with this model of church? Is it possible that we might have avoided at least some of the horrors that we're now seeing coming out of the residential school system? I mean, if there, if there were Christian gatherings where people who were intimate with God maybe would have gotten a word from God, would have perceived a word from God with some strong words of correction regarding what was taking place, would we have been able to avoid some of these horrors? Or is it just that our traditional way of doing things has allowed these things to continue on? I'm saying it is a hypothetical question. I'm not saying that doing church this way would avoid all kinds of other problems. I mean, the New Testament had problems. We read about those, right? But I'm just wondering. Just wondering. Is it possible that through this type of church gathering, God would have corrected his church? Now, friends, over the past year, at Emmanuel Church, we really have tried hard to get more people actively involved in our worship gatherings. To date, 2021, we've had 51 people being willing to be recorded for services. It's been great. Different people reading scriptures, praying, sharing testimonies. It's 
wonderful. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be having four groups of people from Emmanuel Church that will be leading our services. Four groups of people leading the services while the professional clergy is away. I am so excited about this. This, is, this represents over 30 people that are going to be involved. Is it going to be quite as smooth? Well, probably not. Is each service going to include a 30 to 40 minute sermon? No, not likely. But will it give God a chance to speak to all of us through some different people with a bit of a different perspective? Absolutely. These four groups are all going to be talking in a sense about the same theme that just really fits what we've been talking about today. Because the early church in Acts 2.42 we read, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Each group is going to take one component of that, unpack that. But we see how all that fits together, right? How that early church was a very different church Christian community than what we see on Sunday mornings today. And it's my prayer that God is going to show things through this to equip us, to correct us, maybe to rebuke us even, so that we might be more the church that he wants us to be, so that we, Emmanuel Church, might be more in line with his will for what he wants Emmanuel Church to be, what he needs Emmanuel Church to be in this community. As we go into the fall, then after this month, we, uh, we're going to continue on with that goal to see more and more people involved in services. That's probably the reason. Well, that is the reason. We're not planning to live stream our services, but to record it. Because we recognize it's going to be a bit more messy. There's going to be some trial and error in that. So we're not going to live stream it so we can maybe tidy it up a little bit before we put it out on the Internet. But the goal is going to be to see more people involved, allowing God to speak through more people, to up the ante for each of us to be more in tune with our almighty, loving, gracious, heavenly Father and to share what he's given us. Is it going to be a bit more messy? Yep. But are we going to allow to be the scriptures to be the final authority? Or what? Father, this journey, uh, I'm sure it makes a number of us a bit nervous. But this is what you have for your people. And Lord, we know that you speak to us even today. And, and, and that you often speak through people, different people to a community. And so, Father, I, I pray that as we go into this next month and these four groups of people are going to um, lead these services, that it would be rich in all its diversity. Lord, that we would hear the heart of people in what is presented. Father, that you would have your way through those services and that we would grow in our devotion to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Father, I pray that you would grant each and every one of us courage to pursue you in this, to draw near to you, to hear from you, to be willing to share that even when we're not quite certain, Lord, to have these humble attitudes, to be able to take correction, to, oh, Lord, align with your will, to allow this book, this word, to be the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Lord, we do pray for the church family, and we grieve with Jane today. She grieves the loss of her husband, Gary. Lord, wrap your loving arms around her as she's struggling with her own health right now. Lord, bring healing of not just her physical body, but her emotions that are so deeply broken now, so deeply grieving. Father, for others who are struggling with their health, we think of Kim and the pain she faces on a daily basis. Darlene, as she continues to recover. John, as he faces this uh, serious surgery. Alice, as her struggle with health continues on. 
Lord, we think, of course, too, of Carissa, this young gal just continues to battle with her health. And Father, no doubt, each of us can add a number of people to this list. Father, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of pain and disappointment with health or a lack of health, I pray that you would reveal maybe, give, give us a glimpse, give those who are struggling a glimpse of what you are doing in their lives. And may their days be filled with a deep intimacy with you. Lord, may there be beauty in each day. And Father, as we go into the summer, we pray that we would stay in tune with you. That we would be having the self-discipline to, even though the rhythm of church going may not be quite back and the rhythm of small group involvement may have stopped with small groups having shut down, Lord, I pray that our self-discipline would be strong enough to continue to draw near to you, to read your word, to allow you to speak to us. And Father, as a nation, as we celebrate Canada Day, we recognize the dark chapters. And Lord, we beg you for your mercy on this land. We beg you for healing of relationships. Father, we beg you for a way forward through reconciliation. A way forward together with high levels of respect and love. We need you, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as a people of God, truly being a community of faith, learning from each other, being that community that is vibrantly intimate with God, listening to Him, let's sing about it. Come, people of the risen King. Christ be joy.
is all I see. Oh Lord, you're beautiful. And your grace is enough. 